Hello, girly pops. Welcome back to another episode of the Glow Girl podcast. I have another special guest with us for today's episode. Um, we're going to be speaking with Abby Huber. She is an integrative functional dietitian. Welcome, Abby, to the show. Thank you. Super excited to be here. I'm so happy that you, you came to talk to us. Can you introduce yourself to those who maybe don't know you? Yes. So longest title ever, integrative functional dietitian um, and digestive health expert is sometimes what I say at the end of that too, really just to get people leaning in and being like, what does that mean? It's like, well, um, really practicing to get to the root cause of why so many people are struggling with chronic digestive symptoms, bloating, constipation, loose stools, heartburn, and then the often associated skin, acne, psoriasis, eczema, fatigue, sleep issues, PMS, the list goes on and on. There's yeah. a root cause for that. And instead of just managing the symptoms and avoiding foods and changing you know, drastic things in your life so you're tiptoeing around the symptoms, we can actually understand what's happening in the body and remedy it through nutrition, lifestyle, targeted supplements, and kind of expert guidance. And in a nutshell, that is what we do in our one-on-one -on -one practice. I love that. Yeah. But that's very similar to what we do with our clients as well. And I like how you already talked on like all of these symptoms are, are just symptoms, but they're not, you know, necessarily the root cause. And a lot of these symptoms do stem from a lot of GI issues, which we're going to dive deep into in just a second, which I'm super excited about. Um, so before, before we hop into today's episode, as always, I was telling Abby off off camera. Um, we always share wins and 1% betters for the week because we're always, we always like to reflect and grow here. Like that's, that's the main motto. Um, so we'll share one first. Would you like to share your win first? Do you want me to go first? I'm, I'm happy to go first. I was just thinking, I was like, what's my win? Um, <laughs> and actually this week's, I work really closely with a medical intuitive, um, in, in actually my practice with clients, but also personally. And earlier this week was we kind of like shifted around my morning routine and made more of, I've been falling off on my meditation practice. And so this week I like really did the practice every single morning, all the steps of it. And it's like a 30 minute start to finish. Um, and it was just like such a profound, like I really felt a profound difference and I'm like, oh yeah. Okay. Like this is why we do this type of stuff. But I kind of had a, had to have a little bit of a a uh, real kind of a reality check. She was like, you're not, you're not doing the things. I'm like, no, I'm not doing the things, but I, I was saying I was, yeah. <laughs> so there's my win. For sure. I, I definitely feel, feel that one. Um, and then what, what percent better for this week? We'll have you share that one. What is 1% better yeah, that, that you of, in like my life? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, being consistent in this that I'm like, great, this week is off to such a great place. Like, and I'm like, okay, but every single morning we're waking up and doing this. So like, that is absolutely like the consistency is more important than the, like checking the box on any random day. So I guess that's also, it's kind of the same answer for both of those, but I feel like pretty powerfully reconnected back to it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's, that's definitely my 1% better for this week. I, I um, am in a like subscription for, for this breathwork course. That's really helpful mm. and it's only helpful when i'm consistent with it and i that's the thing I not been i have not like you i have not been very consistent with it like i haven't done it in weeks and my my stress levels have been up to here like the past couple of weeks mm. and i can tell you know like when i don't dedicate time to doing those things I'm already a high stress person as it is like, you know, we're just type a people it happens. Um so i'm mm -hmm. really trying to to be better at like actually carving out time in my day to, to dedicate some time to breath work, because I know when I do it, I feel so much better and everything else falls into place. So that's my 1% better for this week. Um, and win from this week is I got back to the gym after taking some time off for like two weeks and letting myself rest and, and chill out. And I got back to it this week and we struggled a little bit, but we're, we're getting back into the groove, which is all that counts. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, just getting back in there and feeling that too of like, okay, this doesn't feel as like easeful, but like we can get back there too. Yeah, you know, I, I took it way lighter. We we only we took extra rest days this week. Like it's fine. You know, I didn't hit every single workout mm -hmm. that I wanted to, but it's a start, and that's okay. <laughs> 
Well, and if you are going through like a more stressful period too, it's like, that's actually like the last thing that we want to be like forcing yeah. ourselves into You're like a long walk actually might be like oh. more of the medicine. Yeah. I I've been taking so many long walks with like my, I have, you'll see her run past here, but my Husky, she's very much needs her walks. So <laughs> she I'm keeps sure. Me, yeah. She keeps me active, but yeah, I mean, you know, I think any, any type of movement is always great, but when you're going through a stressful period, like that's why I took some time off. I was like, I need to just, we're going to focus on Brilliant. sleep instead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm really excited to, to chat with you about some of the topics we're going to cover. We're, we're going to do a very deep dive into mold and, and how that really mm -hmm. affects the, the GI system, because I know a lot of people, whether they, they realize it or not are impacted by these things. And so First, you know, can you kind of just share your, your, um, just experience with like working with people with mold? Do you have any experience yourself with dealing with like mold issues at all? Let's start there. Yeah. So I really came into like this world of mold through my own health. Um, I, you know, running a practice, I've always specialized in kind of IBS and digestive issues. That was really what I struggled with way back in grad school and kind of in conventional grad school, studying to be a dietitian was like, I can't, I can't seem to help my own self. Yeah. Um, chronic constipation and chronic fatigue were the two biggest symptoms that I struggled with. Um, and so then thankfully, very early on in my career in grad school, I found functional medicine and kind of started to get into the field. But even at the in studying functional medicine, mold didn't come up for like a couple more years. Um, or I had heard about it, but it was like still this idea that like, no, it's pretty rare. It's really rare, like, you know, mold, but like, don't, don't search for it. You're not going to like, you're not going to see it that often. So I like, it didn't really come front of mind. And then I kept hitting a glass ceiling in my own health and was kind of like, what the heck? And then in COVID, my health started to actually worsen. My symptoms got more intense. And this is when I was like, listen, like I'm living in my own house. I'm cooking all my own food. I've like literally never been so dialed in, like what's going on. And that's when one of my other colleagues who works in a, um, is, has always been a little bit more like fringe in, in all of the things in functional medicine, um, in the, in the most positive sense was kind of like, listen, I think we need a mold test you. And I was like, okay, all right. If you like say so, this is the same one that introduced me to parasites, like shout out to Robin Voratan. Um, and lo and behold, it came back like off the charts positive. And I moved out of my apartment the very next day, like 24 hours later, packed up, lived on my brother's couch for two weeks, like my dad's house, like just kind of trying to wrap my head around this and then kind of dove headfirst into a program to kind of figure out like, all right, how, not only how can I help myself, I kind of relied on some of my colleagues for that because I'm not a big fan of treating myself, um, but really started to, to understand like, if this is an issue for me in this, you know, I lived in a, in a place that like, didn't look like mold, didn't smell like mold. Mm -hmm. Like anyone walking in would be like, what? Like that's so, you know, just not what we expect it to look like. I think when people think mold, they're like, ooh, like dirty. They like think this very specific picture of it. And it most of the time is very much the opposite because it is a invisible illness. That's kind of why they call it that. Yeah. Um, so really through that experience, it really put it on the radar for me and then starting to kind of um, study more about it and starting to see some of these patterns of symptoms. Because some of the challenge with mold is that it's a multi-system, multi-symptom disorder. So it it shows up in people in differing ways. It doesn't always present with, you know, telltale signs of mold. But if you know what to look for, you can kind of see the collection of things. Yeah, totally. And and I think you you hit it on the head is like there there's so many components that it not only affects as far as like systems in our bodies, but everyone reacts to mold differently and the signs and symptoms show up differently. And when these things are not talked about often, people just end up feeling so frustrated and so confused as to like, what is going on? <laughs> Why am I experiencing all this? And, and how do I get better? Because I know, you know, when I was in my undergrad for becoming a dietitian, like these were not things that we, we talked about and working oh, in a clinical yeah, setting yeah. in a hospital, um, parasites 
bold. Like, like this was like, no, like that, that's not a, that's not a thing. <laughs> so, oh yeah. If anything, you were like, lo- like labeled crazy and yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, they're like, there, there's no such things as like parasites in your store or things like that. And in reality, you know, there, mm-hmm. there are so many things that I think get opened up to like, once you go the more functional route of like, oh wow, like this is actually what makes more sense as to why I'm experiencing these things. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about the relationship between gut and mold issues? Like what does that kind of look like or how does it impact the GI system? Yeah. So mold can impact many different systems in the body. That multi-symptom or multi-system, um, kind of disorder is what it, or yeah, disorder, I guess probably would be the best way to, to, um, present it. So most often we see the symptoms show up in a lot of the tissues that have a very, um, fast turnover rate. So the GI system, which starts all the way at the, in our sinuses and mouth, all the way down to the anus is a, a very, um, an organ system that turns over quickly. Every five days on average, we're kind of creating and shedding new cells. So we can see it in the actual impact of the damage to the cells and the immune system in the gut. Um, Mold interacts with our microbiome because mold is, so when, when we're exposed to mold, we breathe in the mold spores. But what actually makes us sick is not the mold spores. So it's not an allergy to mold because people will often think they're like, oh, well, I'm not allergic to mold. So like I'm not infected, I'm not impacted by mold, but it's not really to do with an allergy because what happens is that the mold spores really stay in the lungs and those can cause like the more typical like histamine, um, runny nose, like all those types of allergy symptoms, but the mold toxins, which are called mycotoxins, are the parts that that impact the immune system and essentially turn the body into an o- kind of overproducing inflammatory um, byproducts and do a lot of damage to cells and tissues. And those mold toxins, those mycotoxins are so tiny that they have the ability to move out of the lungs and then travel systemically to wherever that unique mycotoxin kind of has affinity for. And there are hundreds of different mycotoxins um, that we've kind of identified. There are some more prominent and common ones, and we've understood some of the affinities um, and some of the more kind of presentations. And you can actually test for mycotoxins. So we can, through a urine test, um, kind of identify what are the mold toxins that are present in, in an individual. And then that can help us kind of more narrow down the treatment of how do we kind of mop up that particular mycotoxin and what tissues and systems might be more impacted. Um, the gut is a very impacted system because of that turnover and because of the relationship to the microbiome. And mold is kind of a toxin and fungal joining together. Um, so we have a fungal experience because of the mold, uh, itself. And then we have that toxin experience and that together kind of creates this, it almost turns our microbiome into an inflammatory factory. So we start to see kind of breakdowns in the gut barrier. We start to see more symptomatology in the gut. That's really where all of the IBS symptoms can be present. Some people may be more prone to constipation. Some people might be more prone to loose stools. We then have more of a, um, a possibility of developing things like small intestinal bacterial overgrowth because of the impact that mold has on our detoxification systems. And that's where we are essentially taking the trash out of those mold toxins out of the liver and ideally putting them into bile, which is our digestive substance, but also our detoxification substance, and dumping that into the gut, which is the trash can, which ideally should be dumped into the toilet. What happens though for um, if someone has a very high exposure to mold or if they are someone who's in the 25% of the population whose kind of immune system and detoxification systems can't really identify those mold toxins, I like to think of it that they almost become like, and this is myself in this pool, become like the fish in the fish tank whose filter gets clogged up. 
And then all of a sudden they're the little fish and it's like algae growing all over their tank and they're in there and they're like, no, I can, like, I can see you, but I just feel like I can't really interact in the way. And I'm like fatigued and I'm gaining weight and I have constipation and my skin is breaking out and like all of these really frustrating, confusing symptoms because of congestion to our bile pathways and bile plays a big role in the self-cleaning mechanism of the gut and the education to the microbiome. So there's, there's multifaceted ways that the, both the mold fungus and the mold toxins are essentially kind of dysregulating the self-cleaning and the kind of self-maintaining mechanisms in the body. Yeah. I, as soon as you said the, the fish take analogy, my mind went straight to like the Finding Nemo scene where they, they plug 100%. The, the filter up and everything gets all algae and gross. That's like exactly, you know, like the best way to explain that. That was beautiful. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, going back to, to kind of what you were saying of how, you know, it can impact the immune system and, um, you know, just because entering through like the sinuses and everything else and you know through the lungs and a lot of our immune function is made in the gut and so when we're dealing with all of these gi issues and we're having all of this inflammation like we're having this inflammation right because the body is essentially trying to like attack itself because there is an infection quote unquote kind of going on and it's not really Mm -hmm. sure like where it's at or what it is so it's just sending all of these like white blood cells out to attack these things and we're creating like more chronic inflammation instead of acute inflammation. Is that like kind of what's going on there? Yeah. And in very, like very much of it becomes this, like that chronic situation where we're just getting hit with wave upon wave of inflammation. That is, yeah, the body trying to heal itself, but not being able to actually unadhere this like fungal burden and this toxin burden um, because of that congested filter and because of um, sometimes genetic predispositions and sometimes just if, you know, lots of people, like there's a a percentage that 50% of people, if they identify that they're living in a water damage building where mold is growing, if they move out of that, will improve. The other 50% typically won't and need intervention. So it kind of depends upon the individual, depends upon how much exposure they got and the length of time that they got and what else was happening in their body. Yeah. Yeah. It's very much like you said, you know, it, it's multifaceted as far as to like mm-hmm. how you respond to these things, your environment, other stressors in your life, because, you know, your overall health is going to impact these things too, right? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Okay. And then I know we talked a little bit about like mold toxicity, but what exactly like is mold toxicity? What does that look like or or how does that kind of happen? Yeah. So that kind of fish tank example is we're not able to actually clear those toxins out of the body and they accumulate typically in a lot of our kind of organ systems, fatty tissues. And that's really what's kind of creating this like kind of inflammatory response in the body. And they're, they're very damaging to our actual cells and the structures in our body, almost picturing them like a, a live wire that's kind of like flapping around in the street. And it's going to cause a lot of damage to like the trees around it, the houses around it. That's essentially what mycotoxins are doing in the body. I mean, these are where like we've developed different antibiotics and different um, like biochemical weapons off of mycotoxins. So we've known that these exist in, you know, our world for a very long time and we use them to our own advantage, but we don't recognize that they are like readily a part of our environment, our food system. Um, and are are very much impacting health of millions of people um, in our in the United States and throughout the world. Um, so the way that they present, I guess, like symptom wise, might be helpful to kind of na- like show people 
uh, how many different types of symptoms there like can be. Some of the, I actually like, wrote down a list before because I was like, I don't want to forget any. These are like the big ones that would jump out to me. Um, so chemical sensitivity, someone who especially is sensitive to like fragrances, like you get into an Uber and you're like, oh my God, like I'm going to throw up in the back of this Uber or like somebody's downy softener or any candles, things like that. Um, asthma or any type of kind of breathing, wheezing, um, sinus infections, especially chronic sinus infections, um, tinnitus. So anything in this kind of nasal, upper nasal ear canal, because that's a lot of where we can actually be when we breathe in the actual mold fungal, we can actually harbor it in our sinuses. So there's a lot of support that we need to do above the collar, which is kind of a like to the head and neck so that we can actually clear those um, areas that can actually be kind of feeding some of the continuous fungal exposure in the body. And that's what a lot of what I see in a lot of kind of mold protocols kind of gets missed. Um, and certainly was part of my education, which I learned from Dr. Jill Krista is a, is a must support area. Um, all sorts of fungal issues. So we can see chronic yeast infections, chronic skin infections, rashes, acne, um, fatigue, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, all, all IBS, anything to do with like gut bloating, constipation, loose stools, weight gain, swelling, and edema. Um, so anything of like really like poofy feeling. Um, frequent urination is one I see a lot, um, particularly waking up at night to, to urinate um, several times, dizziness, headaches, memory or cognitive issues, autoimmune conditions, especially the onset of, of maybe one or even two in like kind of a short period of time, like a couple of years, um, infertility or miscarriage, chronic UTIs. Those are kind of like the, the biggies, there certainly is list and other like diagnosable conditions that can go along with like molds and mycotoxins, um, but really just shows like the breadth of like, we just named so many different systems in the body from the reproductive system to the respiratory system, to the digestive system, to the immune system, like to the, to the brain, um, cardiovascular certainly that I guess I didn't call anything up, but like high blood pressure could be on there too. So really just seeing that this is such a, can present in so many different ways in the body. And I always feel that if I have a client that comes to me that I'm kind of like, wow, this person's symptoms are all over the map. And they almost seem to be totally disconnected from one another, but I know that they're not. And those are the type that I get super curious of, we're going to do a little deeper testing and we're going to, we're going to understand if there's a fungal burden component to this. And if there's a mycotoxin component to this, and to this day, I've never tested anyone and been wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I know we didn't necessarily cover some of the other systems that mold can affect or impact and affect too. So I, you know, we kind of just mentioned, you just mentioned like there was the respiratory, there's, you know, brain, there's, um, what was the other one we just mentioned? Um, what else? Like reproductive. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. No, I'll, I got you. <laughs> but yeah, so, and, and I think something in conventional medicine is, you know, they're, they're always looking at these systems separately. Right. And in reality, all of our systems in our body are supposed to work in unison and in harmony. And so when we're like thinking about these symptoms, we're like, okay, well, you know, it might just be a reproductive system issue. It might be, um, you know, a, a cardiovascular issue when in reality, like everything works together. And so how, how does maybe mold kind of impact something like, I think, you know, a lot of my clients that, or like a lot of the listeners here are very much, you know, dealing with, um, hormonal and endocrine issues. So like, you know, how can it sometimes impact something like that? Yeah. Uh, I would say kind of two big things jump out to me. One is the impact that mold and mycotoxins have on the nervous system. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of actually one of the biggest that I realized didn't hit on our list. Um, but the, the essentially the way that, that I even like kind of the energetics of mold is like our limbic system, our kind of like reptilian brain that's telling us, you know, it doesn't kind of come into conscious thought many times, but 
it's the first like reaction to any type of stimulus is really what senses like danger from our environment, oftentimes well before, if not even totally separate from like our own cognitive recognition of it, can sense like danger. And so that I, that kind of experience of mold, it's, it's telling us like, get out, get out of the building. Um, and mold wants to turn us into the like soggy leaf at the bottom of the leaf pile. It just wants to kind of like keep evolution going. And it's like, no, we're going to decompose you and you're going to be part of compost and then you're going to rise again and it's going to be great. Um, so mold's not here to hurt us. It's just like part of, you know, nature. Um, but our like nervous system becomes very chronically stressed in the presence of mold, particularly when we are living in it. Um, so anytime we kind of think too um, about when these symptoms start presenting, we always want to look to the timeline too, to think about, did you move into a new place? Did you go to college in your dorm room? Did you start working in a new office environment? And did these symptoms kind of arise in the next like three months, six months, a year? Because that's a pretty good indication to say, huh, there's probably an environmental like involvement of this. Um, I digress, but I realized that I wanted to put that on the radar too. So that nervous system piece is very much of like kind of educating the safety in our body. And if we have this chronic activation of our nervous system, much more in that sympathetic overstressed state, we're going to have the body really turning off a lot of our like optimal health fertility um, systems because it, 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 you know, rightfully so is like, this is really not a great environment for us to get pregnant, for us to kind of continue, um, you know, creating more stress in our bodies as beautiful as pregnancy is. It's a super stressful event that we're taking on. So definitely from the top down, we can have a lot of the almost like choosing to shut off some of those optimal, uh, health experiences for survival. It's the, the body deciding, Hey, I don't have enough energy to thrive right now. So I'm going to survive. And that means we're going to kind of create a more hypothyroid state. We're going to slow things down. We're going to kind of shut off more optimal fertility, um, probably have an impact on like progesterone production and kind of all in that like stress cascade through our like HPA TG, like all the, all the kind of connections between our brain's communication and all of our kind of endocrine producing organs from our thyroid to our ovaries, to our adrenals. Um, and then even more specifically, mold and, well, mycotoxins are those very damaging toxins, and they're very damaging to our mitochondria. So this is a big part at the very root when we think from a treatment standpoint, what are we actually like really working on to help improve in clients? And that's our mitochondria. So our mitochondria are, as we all learned in high school, like the powerhouses of the cell. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we all love to say that, but like, does anyone really understand like, how, I mean, we do, but, you know, kind of like everyone out there of like, they are the most, like we are as healthy as our mitochondria are, yeah. period. That's it. That's where it starts and that's where it stops. And we have mitochondria in every single organ system outside of the red blood cells. It happens in every single cell in our body and in more of our important energy dense organs like our brain and our reproductive system and our liver are so dense in mitochondria. And the health of those mitochondria are really are what are determining is that organ system going to produce optimal energy? And have kind of a, a in in uh, like an anti-inflammatory balance in that actual tissue and be able to do the functions that it's meant to do. And that's what you know in the kind of reproductive cycle, the health of our mitochondria is so foundationally important. And so it, that's probably one of the pieces that I would highlight as to be that like very direct impact in that like fertility piece. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think you hit the nail on the head is like, you know, when we're dealing with these issues, that's going to trigger that fight or flight response. And when your body's in that chronic state of stress, it's not going to um, prioritize things like fertility and reproduction and, and all of these things. It's just trying to keep your body like going and keep it safe. Like this is not the environment that we we want that in. And so I think that's like a great just connection of, of how all these things really do impact one another, which is wild. 
to, to just think about. <laughs> I know. And just and then it would what, what I mycotoxins just messing things up. <laughs> so and what I think is like also so when we receive that from like the symptoms that we experience in our body that we're like, okay, oh my gosh, now all of a sudden I'm like, I'm gaining weight, but I haven't changed anything. And I'm like feeling really fatigued and I'm maybe my period's getting messed up or my PMS is worse or like my constipation is acting up or whatever these things are. We tend to go harder. We're like, okay, I'm going to show up to the gym now at 530 and I'm not skipping any days. And I'm going to like drop my calories and I'm going to like do all of these really intensive things, you know, with, with good intention is like where they come from because, you know, standard kind of guidance has told us like eat less, exercise more is the solution to everything. Even though like that's actually the downfall of like our entire society, especially for women. Um, but so then it's like, we, we dig ourselves even more into this like hole. And then it's just, there's, there's so many layers to it. And it's, and it usually takes a long time for somebody to go from feeling the symptoms that they're experiencing to finding a provider who actually helps them identify that this might be a piece of the puzzle that you're, that you're dealing with. And we're going to start to like really start to pull the thread. That's a really, I mean, it's your home sometimes that you're living in. So it's like, it's not, it's a very, you know, whenever I identify it in clients, it's like, it's satisfying in one way to say like, we found it. And then I'm like, and I'm going to take a deep breath before I'm going to go into the next part of this. Cause like, there's a lot of steps that are going to happen on the other side. And many of them are not fun. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's such a great topic to hit on is like, you know, how, how does one even get sick from mold or like, you know, where, how does, like you, you figure out, you know, that these, that these things are happening or like what, what can, what can, I guess, be like places like that mold can, can obviously like be in a toxicity state. Yeah. So water damage building. Um, and this is where like, I will go toe to toe. I mean, my whole family's in real estate and like ever since I was a child, my dad's always called mold mildew. He's like, oh, just a little mildew, just a little mildew. Like just put some bleach on it. Like wipe it up. And I mean, that was like how I was raised. It's like, okay, like, yeah, the bathtub, a little mildew, like no big deal. Now having been in this world, I'm like, mildew is just a like downplay of mold. Like if something smells mildewy, it's straight up moldy. And that's a big issue that we as a society, like in so much of our building practices and the people that are kind of like putting together the infrastructure of our country are literally referring to it as mildew and it is straight up toxic mold. Um, and that's where like, we have to be the, the, you know, aware of any type of water or humidity in an environment is a place that mold can grow and mold can grow within 28 to 48 hours. So this is, you know, there's a flood in your basement or a leak in your roof or a, your dishwasher leaked or, um, your bathroom fan's been broken or your kids are terrible about turning the bathroom fan on. Um, Anywhere that there's going to be humidity, there is a possibility of mold growth. And we don't need to be like super crazy, you know, about it. Well, I don't know. I'm a little crazy about things, but, um, but I think just like the awareness of if there's any sort of water incident, we want to be proactive in actually physically removing the material. So we, you can't clean any type of porous material. So that's like wood or, um, cloth or upholstered items, clothing. Um, you can actually wash clothing from, from mold. Um, but if the, the physical building itself, they need to be cut out. So that's where the remediation part of it is is often the step that gets kind of downplayed the most that it's like, oh no, we dried it out. No, it's okay. And sometimes you can dry it out and there's no mold growth. Um, but many times that's the, that's the piece that kind of gets missed. And then that allows that mold growth to grow that spot of humidity or that little leak becomes a big leak. And then all of a sudden it's a, it's a much bigger project and a much more financial project. Um, then, you know, certainly a lot of people want to want to kind of take on. 
Yeah. And <laughs> this just like brings up like so many like PTSDs of like places that I've lived where the insulation oh was God. really poor or, um, you know, like you said that the bathroom fan wasn't working correctly and there's no window. And then like, you know, there's mold or mildew that that's growing and you bring it up to like, I brought it up to my landlords before and they're like, it's fine. Just clean it. And I'm like, I'm not touching that. <laughs> Like, or you'll clean it and it comes right back anyways, which is an, an even, you know, bigger issue. And to clean it, you have to use all of these like nasty chemicals too. And you already don't feel very great. You're like, okay, now I have to expose myself to even more chemicals, like bleach and stuff like that to, to clean it. And it's a mess, <laughs> a big mess that, that no one wants to have to deal with. No. Um, yeah. So- so I know we were talking about too, like obviously a lot of it's, you know, water damaged places. And you were saying too, like, it's not always just old dingy buildings. So mm-hmm. you know, besides just like leaks and things like that, like, are there any other like tell, telltale signs of mold in someone's you know environment? So many times you don't see it. Um, so it's like behind a wall, it's in a basement um, it's behind uh, like any water elect- like a appliance, like a dishwasher or mm-hmm. this underneath the sink. Um, so it's it's it is hard to spot when there you know is mold. So that's where we always want to go by like how do you feel, mm-hmm. and if you're experiencing these kind of symptoms, then it's like okay, then then I like to to test the individual. To say before we go, like spending a lot of money on a mold inspector, which is a whole nother part of a conversation because some are great and some are challenging. Um, You know, let's look at like your body to see, is this actually happening to you? Mm -hmm. And then if it's happening to you, then we start to be a little bit of a detective to figure out, okay, is this in your current environment? is this a past environment? And that's not a perfect science, but sometimes we can look at like, is there active fungal burden in your body? More more possible, um, when there's active fungal burden in someone's body, it's a little bit more suggestion that maybe they're actively living in mold um, versus maybe it was like a past exposure. Like I've worked with, with so many college students now that their dorm, was where they were exposed. And they kind of were just like, yeah, like I just, you know, really didn't feel great through college, but it's college. And then they graduate and they're like, and I continue to just feel terrible. And I stopped my terrible, you know, late nights and drinking and all those habits. And I thought I was going to get better. And I, I just didn't. Um, and it's like that environment and maybe they're, you know, not colonized with mold or maybe they are, but they're still kind of having that exposure from it. Um, so, Definitely, we do want to be looking in our environment, but sometimes we just can't see it. Um, but anything that smells like musty, moldy, anything that like if you're if there's paint that there's any like bulbous kind of like um, any changes to paint, like you can kind of see like if there's been like past water um, exposure or anything that's bubbling, peeling. Um, certainly yellowing of like you know go into an office building, you see like the ceiling tiles, and you're like, oh, those are those are disturbing. You're kind of like, okay, there was definitely some signs of previous water damage here. Um, certainly smell, like, I think I said smell, um, smell to go by like any, again, that like wonderful, like mildew musty smell is pretty much code for mold. Um, and talking to like, if you, you know, if you can get in touch with like tenants who were staying in the place before you, or if you're going to purchase a home, um, kind of asking about like, hey, were there any water events? Were there any floods? Were there any like anything in the history of the building that I should know about in terms of like water events? Those are always like important to know because um, then maybe sometimes you can do a little work before you move in or get a mold inspector kind of to check it out. Um, but we definitely want to be working with mold inspectors who understand that this is a health issue, not a, like they come from the perspective that we are, we are looking at the building for the health of the individual and that the building is sick as opposed to some are just very like contractor focused and they're not, 
they don't really understand that this impacts the individual's health. And so even the tiniest bit for some very sensitive people is going to make a big deal. So there's, you know, now thankfully more um, individuals in that world of kind of mold inspectors who are coming from the place of really understanding this invisible illness um, and advocating on the side of the individual versus arguing against the individual that like, hey, you're sick, but it's not your building. It's kind of like, they're like, no, we know you're sick and we're going to find it. It's just a matter of where, not if. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's, that's such an important topic to, to talk about too, is like you finding someone that's going to be aligning with, with your, you know, health too, like and being an advocate for your health, which is so important. Um, so next question kind of is, I, I know we, we kind of talked about like there being a genetic component to getting sick from mold. So what does that like look like in specific individuals? Like we, we move out and we're still dealing with these issues. So like, what, what does that look like for those people? Yeah. For those people there, they just tend to be like the more mold sensitive people. It's 25% of the population. It's kind of on average. Um, so it's in our kind of like HLA gene, um, I'm probably in that percentage. I have not had my genetics tested because I'm like, sometimes I just don't need to know all the things about my body. I know I'm mold sensitive, but like, I don't need to know. So I don't really guide that many clients to like go down that rabbit hole because it's just like, we either get mold sick or we don't. Um, And, or not necessarily like that, but it's like, we, we're either, we either have this experience and we need to, you know, remediate the mold from our own body. Um or we just never know and we feel good. So it's like, we I don't necessarily feel that genetics hold the codes to everything we need to know about our body because it's only important when the environment around those genetics play into them. Um, but for anyone that is in that 25%, if we do live in a mold sick building, which nobody chooses to, it's just kind of the, the nature of, um, you know, where we just happen to move into. And it's, it's a lot of buildings. It's anywhere like statistics are anywhere from like 60 to 80% of buildings have molds growing in them. So we can't hide from this. Um, and I think, I think we'll I'll, we'll cover some things that we can do proactively, like in our health to support that too, not just to like leave everyone on like gloom and yeah. doom note. Um, <laughs> but that's where like that filter is much more um, prone to getting congested, to getting clogged up, I think yeah. would be like the easiest way to I like describe what happens in those, um, that percentage of the population, their immune system like can't see. Um, this this mold toxin and they're much more sensitive to getting sick from it that that being said that does not mean that they can't heal from it just as readily as someone who doesn't have that genetic component yeah it just it just means we have to do a little bit more supportive work to to help them move through that essentially exactly yeah Yeah. so I guess, yeah, well, more of the nitty gritty stuff, which I'm sure so someone's like, oh my God, okay, now what? Um, so how, mm-hmm. how does someone, you know, start to heal from, from mold and the best way that you can explain it without obviously giving like all of your secrets of what you do? Because I'm sure it's very individualized as well. Um, but, you know, just some basic things of what someone can do. Yeah. And like take all the secrets, but um <laughs> Because it, yeah, it really, at the end of the day, it's like, we need that to be like so yeah. massively individualized and yeah. it, and it needs to be at the pace for the individual. Like, that's the thing that I think in all of our work is like, we can't sprint through healing because that's often where we can get ourselves sicker. Um, that it's like, if we are essentially like, as we heal from mold, what we're doing is we're taking like biohazardous waste out of the body. Yeah. And when we do that, we've got a pull that biohazardous waste from the the storage places that the body's been shoving it in out of like the only way it knows to protect us. So our adipose cells, the organs that it's accumulating in, like the cells, tissues, all of those things, put it back into our circulation, deliver it to our detox organs, predominantly the liver, put it into that bile, get it into the stool and get it out of the body. So this is often where we can run into like feeling 
that kind of recovery process is it can be nice and slow and steady and positive, but there's bumps along the way. And that's where like having the guide that understands, you know, what's appropriate bumps and what are not appropriate bumps and how do we kind of understand the speed that your body wants to go in. And, and, you know, we don't, we have a good guidance manual for it, but it's still listening to that person's body. The very first and foremost things to start with are, and this is like so basic, but like colorful fruits and vegetables, because the phytonutrients in those, the polyphenols in those are very powerful antioxidants that actually are able, and the bioflavonoids are kind of like a specific type of polyphenol that are actually able to sometimes like kind of unadhere those mycotoxins from cells and actually help to kind of repair some of the damage that they've done and help to start that very gentle um, kind of protective process, a little bit of that detoxification process too. So really increasing the amount of fruits and vegetables. Now, this is where it gets tricky that if like somebody's like, okay, but I'm chronically constipated and I've got some IBS symptoms and you want me to eat a ton of fiber because I'm going to be eating more fruits and vegetables. And it's kind of like, okay, this is where then we need to come in with the skills of like, okay, here, we're going to do this in this way. I mean, this is where juicing can be a really nice vehicle for individuals that are recovering from this because it's a gentle on the GI system, but it's really creating more bioavailability in those, um, polyphenols and those colorful constituents of fruits and vegetables. And those are, I mean, they sound so basic, but they are so, so powerful for helping us to kind of recover from mold. Um, We want to make sure that we're in an environment without mold. Um, We want to kind of pay attention to our like indoor air quality. So like open your windows every day, get some like circulation in, get a lot of outside time going for walks, really helping to focus on your nervous system would be the first and foremost place to start. Um, so that's, you know, there are some really great self-guided programs like vital side to actually lean more into like, what does nervous, um, kind of regulating our nervous system deeply look like. Um, but we don't necessarily have to pay for a program. It could just be doing some like meditation and deep breathing and really, you know, stick, sticking to a very strict sleep schedule, getting light exposure in the morning for our circadian rhythm. Like those are the foundations that, um, I obsess over with clients and we obsess in our podcast over and all of the things, because those are such medicine. And when we come from any place of dysregulation in our health, we have to start with the foundations or else we're, we're really not going to kind of like get anywhere productive, no matter how many fancy detox supplements we throw at somebody. Yeah. I'm sure my listeners are going to laugh because these are the basics that I talk about all the time too. And they're probably like, oh, <laughs> but I it, totally, yeah. <laughs> it does come back to the basics because if you don't have, like you said, we, we can throw all of these supplements at you as possible, but if we don't have these foundations in place, then we're not going to be able to start effectively healing, even with the help of some supplementation. Um, and I really like that, you know, we, we talked about plant diversity because really, you know, with the gut microbiome, like we need plant diversity because that's how we feed all of that good bacteria in our body. But obviously, you know, everyone is very individualized. And if you are dealing with some bacterial overgrowth or IBS or things like that, we can start to get a little tricky. Um, but yeah, those are, are awesome places to start. Um, my, my last question for you, I know we, we touched a little bit about testing and I think you said, you know, uh, urine test is typically how, you know, we typically test for these things. Is there any other, you know, type of testing that someone can do to test for mold or is like urine kind of the gold standard? Yeah. So, um, I mean, in my practice and the way that like, I just view mold as, I like to start with the individual before we start testing the environment and kind of getting into any of of the like kind of looking suspiciously at our environment that it's like, okay, hey, let's not waste any energy because oftentimes too, I'm like, you're exhausted already. So like, let's let's figure out what we're dealing with. Um, So I usually like to run two tests together. One um, organic acids test that's going to tell us about the fungal burden in the body. Um, and can give us a little bit of a potential picture of if we're, you know, a little bit more sign of, are we actively living in this full fungal burden? Again, not a perfect science there, but it's played out to be pretty true most of the time. Um, and then two, a mycotoxin test to say like, okay, what is it? 
that we're actually like looking at in terms of those those mold toxins in your system. Um, the next step from there, and this is actually a, a colleague of mine and I were just talking the other day and she's been doing this and I'm going to start doing this with clients is actually using humidity meters mm -hmm. um, for any areas of the home that you have suspicions in before bringing in any like ERMI tests or anything like that. Cause it's like, we have to have humidity and like water in the yeah. environment. I mean, it certainly can be past water um, exposures and like damage. So, so it doesn't necessarily hold true for that if it was like a flood and then the flood's gone. So not a perfect science to this, but um, they're really cheap. They're like $30 or maybe even less than that. And she has them kind of putting in like the, the bathroom or the bedroom, like wherever the kind of suspicious areas are. And then just looking at um, where like relative humidity is for that room. And if it's like after somebody showers, the humidity is obviously going to go up because we just showered, but it should come down after two hours. But if it stays up for like four hours, then you know like, oh, the ventilation in this room is not good. Okay. I need to do something about it. So that felt very, I was like, oh, that's a great way to kind of more like proactively understand about where are there some like sick homes or like sick um, rooms in your home maybe that need some support. Um, and then those might be where we bring in like an ERMI test or maybe it's enough for us to say like, hey, let's let's invest in bringing a really good mold inspector in. I've worked personally with We Inspect. Um, who is a, a national kind of mold inspection company that really comes from the perspective of like mold sick individuals. I had a really wonderful experience with them. Um, so that's usually where I like guide people. If they're going to kind of make the investment in doing the testing, I'm like, we're going straight to the top and like, we're not, we're not trying any of these like local people, like we're going straight to the top. Yeah. yeah I think that that's such a, I, I didn't even think about that yet. Just like testing each room individually with those mm -hmm. many tests. Like that's such an easy, and cost effective way to, to just kind of dig a little deeper without having to, you know, actually dig a little deeper yet. Um, totally. And, and I know, you know, obviously a lot of these things, um, end up creating some GI issues too. So do you typically run like a GI map on some individuals as well or something? Oh yeah, like definitely. Yeah. Then we're kind of, um, like understanding, like, how is it presenting in that same individual? I would say pretty much across the board in every single client that comes into my one-on-one -on -one practice, we're running a GI map, typically a Dutch test on any kind of like cycling female. Yeah. Um, and, and then usually a comprehensive blood panel. Um, and then, you know, specialty tests along the way, if there's some like unique pieces going on, but those are kind of our foundations. And then we're kind of figuring out like, based on their symptoms, based on the patterns of information that we get. And if we start doing support for them and we're like, you're really, you're not getting better in the time period that we would expect you to get better. And like, what else is going on here? And then we typically start to go down the, you know, the rabbit hole of mold. Um, because most of the time clients don't come to us being like, so I have mold. Yeah. You know, it's like, I mean, some do now and having unfortunately jumped from like provider provider being like, I know I have molds because somebody mold tested me, but they didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. Um, or they, you know, I didn't feel good in their care or like kind of now, unfortunate, a lot of people are like, I have to treat molds. And yet like, they don't know actually how to support that person in a way that like makes the person actually feel good. Cause yeah. you can feel kind of junky if somebody's pushing you too hard. Um, so yeah, we try to be, you know, once someone comes into our one-on-one -on -one practice, we're like, we are understanding as much as we possibly can about you so that this is the last place that you need to, we're going to deeply teach you about your body. And our goal is for you not to need us anymore. And for you not to need like, at, you know, another provider again after this for the, the best that we can. Um, we even bring in, like we partner with a, a nervous system um, kind of regulation program so that they can do nervous system regulation while they're doing our work with us. Cause that's not our, you know, direct um, expertise and really trying to have kind of all the tools that we've seen be impactful and, and not even just for mold nervous system regulations for, for everyone. Everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Self-included. <laughs> yeah. Oh uh, yes. And, and I, I love that. I feel like we're on like a very same wavelength here of like, that's the exact, you know, kind of model that I work with with my clients as well is, you know, I want this to be the last place for you and we're going to run as much comprehensive, you know, testing that we can so we can actually see what's actually going on and what we need to do. And, you know, mm -hmm. if we're not getting better, then we have to investigate further because 
I know there's so many people who are pushed around to different provider, different provider, and they're like, I've spent all this money and I have no idea what's going on. So, or I do, but like, there, there's no plan of action to actually get me better. And so it's like, cool, like now what? So I love that yeah. people are just, you know, doing the work of like, let's investigate and being, you know, advocates for people's health health as well. Um, if someone can take, just last thing, if someone can take one thing away from this episode, what would it be? That if you don't feel well in your body, it is, it is truth. Like don't, ever let anyone tell you that there's nothing wrong with you. And, um, you know, I have had so many clients having a just terrible experiences with providers telling them that like point blank young women don't get mold toxicity and throwing their testing across the room, having just like really uncomfortable conversations. And the immediate response in like our, our heads at that now should be this person doesn't know what they're talking about and I'm going to get out of this office as quickly as possible and find somebody who's going to listen to me because I am not making this up. Um, no one makes up feeling unwell in their body. And I, I think that that is, you know, just that validation in like, if you don't feel well in your body, there is, you know, something at, at going on, start with the foundations exhaust the foundations because sometimes that is sometimes that's as far as you need to go and it's like oh my god they're magic like unsexy magic great um but if those don't like get you where you're going in like three to six months then you know coming to a functional dietitian um is that that i mean i'm you know we're biased because we are them but um just i feel like the world that we get to see i I trust so many of my colleagues with my life that if I if my health ever goes sideways again, the first providers that I'm signing up for are my near and dear colleagues, and I would trust no one else more than them. Absolutely, I am mm -hmm. a thousand percent with yeah. you on that one, and I think that was that was a beautiful takeaway. So, where can everyone find you? I know you have a podcast, and we were also talking about a, a self paced guide that you have. So, give everyone the the spiel about that. Yeah. So active on Instagram at above health, um, talking about all gut stuff over there. Uh, then I run a podcast with a very good friend and colleague. I am a gut specialist. She's a hormone specialist. Our pod, our podcast is called your body has your back. Um, and we are really kind of trying to give away all the information that we have to say, like, take these steps and run with them. And ideally, we want these to be the things that our clients are practicing before they even come into our offices. Um, and we're just so in love with, I'm sure as you are too, and like the the information that people get from like, come when they come from the podcast, I'm like, oh, you're like the best client that ever existed. I yeah. love it. <laughs> um, so we're really active over there. We'll have a new season coming out in September. Uh, and then we do have a self-paced course that's under $200. It's called the Nourish Gut Guide. And that is, again, in that same idea of every foundation from really specifically from kind of the IBS standpoint that I would want someone practicing. And oftentimes some of the answers are in those foundations and someone doesn't need to even come into our one-on-one -on -one practice. Um, that's really why it's a standalone program um, and kind of why we like really encourage people to start there. And then certainly if, you know, after three to six months, if they're still stuck in the same place, then kind of coming up into our one-on-one -on -one program would probably be make sense at that point. Um, and that you can get information right from our website or certainly from Instagram on that. Awesome. I will leave all of your info in the show notes for everyone so that they can check out your podcast and, and the self-paced guide. Cause I think that'd be really awesome for people. Um, well, I appreciate you for coming on the podcast and, and talking with us. This has been honestly so like informative and, and really helpful. And I'm sure someone is going to get a ton of value from this. I'm glad this was so fun. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. And thank you guys for listening. Um, as always, please Feel free to leave a review and rate the podcast. That always helps. And I will talk to you guys in next week's episode. Bye.